That chant just now starts with a very strange phrase, those who don't discern suffering. You would think that everybody would discern suffering. But the Buddha is talking about understanding it on a deeper level. When he explains the, the truth of suffering, he talks about aging, illness, and death, being separated from what we like, having to live with what we don't like, not get, getting what we want. Those are all forms of suffering we're familiar with. But in John Lee's words, those are the shadows of suffering. They're not the real thing. The real thing is the clinging. We latch on to things as being us or ours or having to be this way or that way. There are lots of different types of clinging. We like to cling to our sensual fantasies. That includes everything from lust down to just the idea of a good chocolate cake tomorrow. We hold on to that and go over and over and over in our minds with that. And there's some suffering there. We wouldn't say there's suffering. We actually like it. And this is one of the strange things about this. A lot of things that we like bring suffering. And we wonder why we feel so worn down at the end of the day, worn down over as life gets longer and longer. It's because we keep running for the things that create suffering. We're blind to what we're doing. That's what the Buddha means when he says, when you don't discern suffering. That's what he's telling you to do, is focus on this issue. Trying to figure out what is, what is it that weighs the mind down? What is it that puts a squeeze on the mind? If you really see suffering, understand it then the energy to practice has to come. You can't just stay wallowing around in suffering or being trapped in suffering. You want to find a way out. The question came up today about how to put more energy into the practice. And a lot of it's right here, reflecting on how much suffering you've been through and how much more there's going to be if you don't do something about it, and really letting it go to your heart. A lot of people push it away. Years back I was on a plane coming back from Texas with a John Sawat, and there was a man sitting next to us, and he probably noticed that we're Buddhist monks, and he'd heard something about how Buddhists say that life is suffering. So first thing he said when he turned to us is, my life isn't suffering. And they went down and described his life. From my point of view, there's a lot of suffering. He had a son in prison. He had a daughter who had gotten involved with a junkie, given birth to a cocaine baby that she couldn't raise, so the grandparents had to raise it. And on top of that, he lived in Blythe, which, if you know California geography, is about as bleak as you can get out in the desert. But he kept insisting that he wasn't suffering, and the more he insisted, the more you are beginning to realize he was suffering quite a lot. But the only way he could live was to deny, push it away. We can push it away only for so long. Your arms and hands get tired after a while, and then it comes rushing in. The best course is to put the mind in shape so we can actually look at the suffering. This is why the Buddha said you want to comprehend suffering and stress. The word dukkha can cover everything from really heavy suffering down to very subtle burdens on the mind. But you want to comprehend it. You want to understand it. And then you can do something about it. And part of comprehending it really, is, really means seeing how much of it there is. The Buddha didn't say life is suffering. He just says there is suffering. And it comes from this clinging. And the clinging comes from craving, and the craving comes from ignorance. So we want to bring more awareness to what we're doing, so we can see where we're creating unnecessary suffering for ourselves. Because as the Buddha points out, this is the suffering that weighs the mind down. Everyday things happening don't have to weigh the mind down. It's when we grab onto them with our clinging that turns them into suffering that burdens us. 
leaves us feeling ragged at the end of the day. So to look at suffering, though, you can't just plow right into it. You've got to have a good basis of well-being in the mind, part of the mind that can step back and not just jump right into it. That doesn't mean running away from it, but having a strong basis inside, a good foundation inside, where you feel secure, you feel at ease. And this is why we work on concentration. Then from the concentration, you can look and see, well, where I'm, what am I doing that's causing stress? What am I doing that's causing suffering? Do I have to do it? It's when you see it and when you see that you don't have to do it, that's when you can let it go. In other words, you just stop engaging in those activities. So you look at your life and see what part of the life is weighing you down. And ask yourself, okay, what am I doing to contribute to that weight? What am I trying to hold? What am I trying to to cling to. The Buddha said there are four kinds of clinging. There's clinging to sensual desire. He uses the word sensuality, but what he means is the fascination we have with our sensual plans for things. It's not so much as sensual objects. It's we like to plan around sensuality. And think about what would this be like? What would that be like? How about this? How about that? The mind gets really fascinated that way. But in the Buddhist terminology, he says it's like a dog chewing on bones. You don't get any meat, you don't get anything at all, just a taste of your own saliva. And the mind gets bent in a certain direction, that it starts looking for pleasures that it fantasizes about, and then it'll start doing all kinds of things to get those pleasures, and it ends up suffering. That's one. Another one is clinging to views about certain things, particularly identifying yourself, I'm this kind of person, I'm that kind of person because I've got this view, I understand things in this way. I'm right, everybody else is wrong. And there's such a thing as right view, but you don't hold on to it to make yourself right and other people wrong. You hold on to it because it help, it's helpful in putting an end to suffering. It's true. But if you grab onto it, then all of a sudden it becomes a burden. So you have to learn how to use right view about issues around suffering, for example, as a tool. It's clinging to habits and practices. In other words, you do certain things because you feel that by doing them, by obeying these rules, obeying those rules, it makes you better than other people. Or that somehow all you have to do is just obey the rules and you will come out clean. Nobody can criticize you. Well, there are a lot of people who hold to the rules and the pride that goes around that and the unskillful attitudes they have for other people who don't hold to those rules. That's not clean at all. And there's a lot of suffering around that. This is, notice this doesn't mean that we don't hold to the precepts. We do, but again, it's not to make ourselves better than other people. It's because we realize that if we don't hold to the precepts, we're going to create suffering for ourselves and for others. And this clinging about ideas of who you are, that you have this kind of self, that you have that kind of self, or maybe you don't have any self at all. Any of those things, that's a lot of the clinging right there. You notice with clinging to views and clinging to habits and practices, a lot of the problem is the sense of I, I, I that de develops around that, especially the I'm better than somebody else because of my views or my practices. And what the Buddha says is, instead of focusing on who you are, focus on what you're doing. It's not that you have to erase your sense of self. It's simply that you realize, just put the sense of who you are aside for the time being, and realize that there are lots of yous in there. There's the self that's a parent, there's a self that's a child, there's a self that's a, someone at work, there's a self that's someone at home, some, the self is someone out have, trying to have a good time. We have lots of different selves. 
And what you've got to do is begin to notice that each of those selves is a result of certain activities. And some of the activities are skillful and some of them are not. So you start sort through your collection and learn to look askance at the selves you have that are creating most of the trouble. This is where you have to have an identity that, as a meditator. This is very helpful. The identity as a meditator. I am a meditator. is a good self to have. Because you start getting lazy in the morning and say, I don't want to wake up. Well, is this a meditator? No. Meditators get up early in the morning. They meditate. They find time. That kind of self is useful. Because you need a certain amount of self in order to be a self-starter. You can't all stay at the monastery the whole time. And even at the monastery, you've got to be a self-starter. Even more so when you're out there in the land of wrong view. You've got to see that you do suffer. And if you don't do anything about it now, when are you going to do something about it? And as life goes on, it gets harder and harder to deal with these things. And the issues of suffering don't go away. It's not like you have to work on this until age 65 and then you can retire. The problems get heavier and heavier as you get older. And for most people, their minds get weaker and weaker if they haven't had any training. So you've got to discern suffering. And have that sense that I don't want to suffer. That I is a useful one. Nourish that sense of self. Keep it going. And in John Munn's terms, it's that I who doesn't want to come back and be the laughing stock of the defilements ever again. In other words, you've been driven around by greed, aversion, and delusion for who knows how long. And there's a part of you that says, enough. Nourish that part. Keep it strong. Give it a larger voice in your decisions as to when to meditate, when to read the Dharma, when to turn off the TV, when to turn off the internet. Now, there's when to do the things that you know are actually good for you. Try to develop that sense of self as much as you can. There will come a point further down in the path when you let that go again, because you see that that self is an activity that has served its purpose, and the path picks up more and more momentum. And you can focus more and more on exactly what am I doing right now that's creating suffering. As the Buddha said, eventually you get to the point where you see that it's just suffering arising and suffering passing away. And you don't think in terms of who you are or who's feeling the suffering. It's just these are the activities that constitute suffering. These are the ones that cause it. These are the activities that are suffering. The question of who's suffering doesn't enter into it. The who, the self, whatever, is just put out off to the side. And when you see the activities that are causing suffering are unnecessary, you drop them. And then it so happens that you drop a lot of your sense of self in the process. But you don't have to attack your sense of self. Just notice if there is an I in here that's causing trouble. Maybe we should pull away from it. See it as an activity rather than as a thing. And it's an activity you don't have to engage in. It's an identity you don't have to assume anymore. The eye that feels wronged about things, the eye that feels whatever. The ones that lead you to do all kinds of unskillful things. Learn how to step away from them. And it's in this way that you can gain a handle on this problem of suffering, so you really discern it, understand it, and understand the way to put an end to it. 
that's when you've really benefited from the practice. So keep this point in mind. The reason we're not practicing more is because we don't really discern suffering. You've really discerned how much it was driving you and placing all kinds of unnecessary burdens on the heart. You'd want to do what you could to put an end. At least get your head above water so you can see clearly where you are and where you can go. That's when you can be, as the Buddha said, consummate in release of awareness and release of discernment. Freedom. That's what he's talking about. He's offering the freedom, he says, as possible. And just look at your mind every day to see how many times you say yes to that possibility, how many times you say no. When you find yourself saying no, ask yourself, have you had enough suffering? And hopefully something inside will say, yeah. Okay, you can build on that. 